Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of The Future Human. Alex Gomez Marin today will be in conversation with Luca Puzzati discussing AI and psychoanalysis. Luca is a postdoctoral researcher at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. His research focuses on philosophy of technology and AI, technology assessment, AI ethics, and ethics of quantum technologies. He has published numerous papers and books, including his latest book, The Algorithmic Unconscious, How Psychoanalysis Helps in Understanding AI. Luca today will be in conversation with director of the PARI Center, Alex Gomez-Marin, a physicist turned neuroscientist who since 2016 has been head of the Behavior of Organisms Laboratory in Alicante, where he is an associate professor of the Spanish Research Council. And with that, I will pass it over to you, Alex. Welcome. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you everyone for joining once more. As I was saying, I see familiar faces and also faces I sometimes don't see, so that's it's really great. All right. So, so some of you may know that here in this series, the future human, well, this is a, if it was a problem, it's a big, big problem. It's a hyper object we're trying to make sense of. And there's so many aspects of the future human. And one that we must tackle at some point that I wanted to have in the program was, of course, AI. But I didn't want to have a talk about AI from the usual hype, hope, cope, dope, bullshit. And, and even if it's even if it's fair to have the usual and to hear the usual conversations about AI, I wanted something perhaps more nuanced or at least coming from a different perspective where this intuition that some of us may have, like the AI, not, not, so, not caring so much about AI, but more as AI as a mirror to our own humanity would be reflected, if I can do the double metaphor. And also in this case, we're going to talk with Luke about AI in the context of psychoanalysis. And I, I must confess, and it's not a confession, I, I, I've, I go to therapy and I've experienced some of those concepts, but I hadn't read them in an academic context and I hadn't read them so well articulated in my amateur view as I read them in this paper that Luca published in 2020, I think, The Algorithmic Unconscious. So... It was like a really interesting combination to talk about AI and what, what AI really is, and really could be many things here from a psychoanalysis perspective. And so I'm, I'm delighted to be with you, Luca. And I know this conversation is not going to be easy because these are difficult concepts. And just a reminder to everyone and myself, this is not an interview. And here I'm trying to educate myself. And if we can all educate ourselves, that's the purpose. So... Let's go into it and let's unpack your main thesis. So I'll ask, um, just to get it started, in your article, I've read that you say what, what, sometimes it's useful to say what this is not about, right? And so this is not about how or whether machines are, can, or will be conscious. Um, it's more about how humans change in interactions with, in interaction with other humans and machines. So perhaps we could start framing it there. So thank you. Thank you so much for uh, this invitation before. Um, first, uh, so thank you so much for uh, for your interest in my, my research. I'm very glad to be here. So, um, yes, you, you want to start from a very interesting point, uh, uh, because in that article, uh, one of the main assumptions I, I, I made was that uh, if we want to start thinking about AI from the uh, from the question uh, can AI be conscious? Uh, is uh, AI like uh, human consciousness? Uh, is AI about to 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 to, to get conscious? Uh, I think this is a, a wrong point of view. I mean, not because of the of the question in itself. But because it's something else, it wasn't my interest to to focus to focus on this question. My interest was much more understanding how the notion of human unconscious changes in a technological environment, in a technological system. So how 
the uh, technology, how uh, a specific technology uh, like AI can impact on the human unconscious, on the human unconscious dynamics, human unconscious drives. That was my first. Uh, that was my first objective. Also, because uh, I think that uh, um, the question of uh, machine consciousness is wrong because it's something else. It would uh, take us too too far from the from the real question, which is uh, the relation between us and these technologies in this in this time in our time. Maybe in uh, in the future, a machine will uh, will get uh, conscious, will develop some kind of consciousness. We don't know yet, actually. Mm. Now I think it's much more interesting to understand how. We relate, we refer to this technology and how this technology can change our our mind. Yeah, so if I can rephrase this, and I'll be doing this today just to make sure I follow you, is rather than asking whether whether we can make machines that are conscious, it's more about what those machines make to our own unconscious, right? It's a... I would say so, how these machines transform our unconscious uh, before in your uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, when you start this conversation, uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, concept of hyper hyper object, which is a very interesting concept by um, Timothy Morton. Um, I would say that uh, today we have to think of human mind as a hyper hyper object in the sense that we cannot uh, talk uh, about uh, human mind in the same way as before. Mm. We have to take into consideration the relation between your human mind <clears throat> and technology. Also because the relation with technology has become pervasive in our, in our world and can influence anything. And this is also, um, I would say, something very interesting because it, thinking about the relation between the human mind and AI, and specifically thinking about the relation between unconscious and AI, forces us to answer a crucial question. What is AI? What is artificial intelligence? Why do we need artificial intelligence why do why do we want a machine to be like humans okay let's slowly unpack here because i wanted to ask you about the unconscious of course because we need to talk about that but before and we will for sure um let's also say according to what my understanding of what you've written what ai is not and you write somewhere that ai is not like any other type of technology so so perhaps and later on we can i can even quote your own not definition but your own claim about what ai is from this psychoanalytic interpretation but perhaps you could make before that uh, uh distinction between ai as a technology and previous other other previous forms of technology and it sounds that you're saying it's 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 something really different. Yes, I mean, it depends. It depends on um, on what you mean by AI, in the sense that uh, how, how is your approach? I mean, uh, yes, AI it's something uh, it's something different from other technologies, from previous technologies, but at the same time, it's not so different. What do I mean? Um, we we shouldn't we shouldn't I would say the best way to approach AI is not to see uh, in AI a kind of revolution of human world a kind of some uh, uh, something that will uh, will change uh, our entire culture and knowledge. AI are technologies that are able to simulate human behavior in many different forms in a convincing way. So they are able to collaborate also with humans to realize and uh, uh, to achieve human, uh, to perform human, uh, 
human activities, human achievement in an autonomous way. But of course, they are not, uh, we don't have the what we call AGI, artificial general intelligence. So we have smart technologies that are very good in doing specific, specific tasks that are very good in doing something in which humans are quite limited, but we don't have a kind of uh, the, 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 the cyborg uh, we, we, we can see, we can, uh, we, we can have in the, in the movies, in the Hollywood movies. We have smart technologies that are very able to um, interact with humans, also to give us more knowledge about specific problems. But the dream of uh, artificial general intelligence, I think it's quite far. So this is, this is my approach to AI. Mm, for example, ChatGPT, one of the last uh, big AI systems uh, that create a sort of uh, a sort of uh, interest, public interest, uh, new public interest in uh, in AI. Yeah, it's very good in doing something. It's very good in uh, in a conversation, on producing knowledge, give me some information, but of course. Uh, after a long experience with, with ChatGPT, you can notice that there are some uh, limitations that it's not like a human agent. Anyway, so this is, this is my approach to AI. I would say also, if I can add something uh, to what you said before, also the notion of unconscious, it's quite problematic because uh, of course, my approach to the notion of unconscious is from psychoanalysis, from Freud, Lacan, and other important uh, psychoanalytical schools. But we have to be aware that today we know a lot of a lot much more about about our brain, about our mind than before. So today, the notion of unconscious is much more complex and uh, ramificated that uh, that before so today we talk about uh, cognitive unconscious which is much more uh, uh, unconscious cognition and unconscious perception we talked about uh, unconscious uh, form of unconscious behavior we talk about subliminal stimuli and subliminal perceptions so the notion of unconscious uh, the Freudian notion of unconscious, which is connected, mainly connected to what Freud calls uh, drives and uh, sexual drives. I would say it's only an, a single approach. It's only a possible approach to the unconscious. Mm -hmm. Unconscious has become much more complex. Now, I don't want to straw man the usual straw manning of Freud, for instance, in university. Sometimes as a neuroscientist, I'm asked to teach at the psychology department. And, and I ask them, so, especially when the students are already advanced, if they've heard about Jung, and they, they haven't, <laughs> which is remarkable and understandable. And I ask them, well, what about Freud? And they say, yeah, of course we have, but you know, whatever. Yeah. So what can you save? from Freud, for, for some of us who are, say, ignorant, really, about his contribution, and then how do you bring it to your own more complex, more up-to-date understanding of the unconscious, because that's going to be central in your, again, in your claim, in your definition of what AI is, which I'll read in, in a few minutes, and I'll repeat, because I like also the the the, the, the audience to, to just have the, the main take, but Okay, so what do we do with Freud unconscious more than a century later? I would say that uh, we should not abandon abandon Freud in the sense that uh, the most important intuitions, Freud intuition, 
are still are still uh, absolutely valid. The intuition that uh, our mind is mainly unconscious. So the 95% of our mental activities are unconscious. Has been confirmed also by neuroscience. Today we talk about uh, science of consciousness and uh, I think about the, 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 the work of many different neuroscientists. Uh, I think about uh, um, Damasio, for example, but many others. Today we talk about uh, unconscious mind as the main, I would say, the essence of our mind. Anyway, also, do for also Freud's intuition about uh, main intuitions about sexuality and many others about human behavior are still valid. Basically, of course, today the big problem for me is the empirical validation of psychoanalysis. This is the, a big point, and the empirical validation of psychology, not because. Uh, I don't think that uh, psychoanalysis and uh, psychology don't have an empirical validation. But I think that uh, as people who study this kind of things, psychoanalysis, psychology, we have to think about this problem, the empirical validation of our search. How can we empirically validate our concepts in psychoanalysis, for example, Lacan's symbolic or Lacan's uh, stage of mirror. How can we validate this kind of hypothesis? Which kind of experiments should we implement? Should we realize? Should we conceive to validate this kind of uh, this kind of hypothesis? But this is, of course much bigger problem and much com more complicated than the relationship between the human unconscious and AI. I would say that studying the relation between the human unconscious and AI can add something new to the research on the human unconscious. For example, I refer here to a new perspective, a new research field, a new research line in uh, cognitive science, uh, the material engagement theory. Uh, according to the material engagement theory, the material culture, so our object, our artifacts, are an active part of our cognition, our cognitive activity. This is very interesting because this means also that artifacts, our environment, our objects, the objects with which 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 um, we interact are part of our mind. Our mind is not just our brain. It's also the set of interactions with the environment and technological artifacts. This is very interesting because we can extend this in the direction of unconscious. So our conscious and unconscious mind are shaped, are defined by the relationship with artifacts, with the material culture. This opens a new, I would say, new research line about the nature of unconscious also. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it can be taken this is, in a... For, sorry, for a, if I interrupt you. This is something we can find also in Freud. The influence of objects also. Artifacts on our cognition, our, our mind. Yes, I was going to just make the remark that this can be said in a in a in a light or weak sense or in a strong sense because if you it reminds me of the the embodied enacted extended cognition, um, which is more like I see it as like the heterodoxy. It's not heretical. It's like the heterodoxy in in cognitive neuroscience as opposed to a more neurocentric functionalist aspects and. But when you uh, when you kind of push people to recognize the importance of having a body, being in this room and not other, seeing buildings of a certain type, shapes and not others, and so on, they'll say, sure, of course. I mean, these details matter. But when you emphasize that in a in a stronger sense, 
this this context becomes constitutive. So, well, you made me remind you, you you reminded me of the of these four E's in cognitive neuroscience, and th I can see now the transition from this material culture to what these materials now being technologies now being AI in particular is doing to our minds now in particular our unconscious, right? So that's another way of approaching the problem, as I see. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, sometimes I think, uh, sometimes I talk of uh, um, an extended unconscious. Mm. It's very interesting because uh, <clears throat> you mentioned the extended, uh, extended mind, extended cognition. I think it's a very interesting perspective in the cognitive science, also because uh, it pushes us to think more in a less anthropocentric and less brain-centric way, in a less uh, su subject-centered way. I don't know if, if you know what I mean. This is one of the main, that, that was one of the, my, the, the, the main inspiration of my, of my work on AI and psychoanalysis. I started thinking about possible relations between AI and psychoanalysis because I was not satisfied with the, 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 the main approaches uh, in philosophy of technology, post-phenomenology, but also analytic philosophy of technology, but also ethics of technology are all inquiries, all investigations that approach they think of technology from a subjectivist point of view, in the sense that they evaluate technology, they think of technology as an extension of our intentionality, basically. Mm. Also the, the philosophy of design, for example, which is a kind of branch of philosophy of technology, thinks of artifacts as implementation, realization, how to say, incorporation of our of our um, intentions of our consciousness basically i mean that uh, in philosophy of technology also for example post phenomenology post phenomenology is a particular kind of philosophy of technology and the basic idea is that technology is always a mediation between the human subject and the world this mediation is always thought as an extension of human intention, an extension of human intentionality. The problem is that all these approaches completely miss our desires, the relation between our desires and technology, our needs, our intentional act our intentional behavior and technology. They completely miss the relationship between our unconscious, so the biggest part of our mind, and technology. So which kind of desires do we project on our technologies? Which kind of unconscious desires do we project on our technologies? Which kind of unconscious fantasies do we project it on, on our technologies? Because they count. They can also influence our conscious fantasies, our conscious intentions, our conscious desires. So would it be fair to say, again, as a summary point, that in, in, in wondering about the interaction between humans and machines, specifically AI, that this interaction can be seen through extension or mediation, but a sub subtle, different and important way of conceiving it is through projection. And that's why we enter into psychoanalytic land. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you're referring to the concept of uh, projective identification I mentioned in, uh, in that article. That, that idea was, uh, I mean, I was trying to yeah, to complexify and to put into question the notion of mediation. Hmm. So in that article, I define the artificial intelligence as the set of our projective identification, the identification we project on the artifact. 
we always have to consider that uh, uh, artificial intelligence the goal, I mean, the, 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 the meaning of artificial intelligence is always to simulate humans, to be like humans. So there's, there's, there is, in artificial intelligence, a kind of desire to be like humans, mm. to be like human subjects. And uh, this is a projection of human agents on, on the artifacts. So, for example, when I interact with uh, ChatGPT, there is the interface, there is the screen. And in the screen, I, I write my text, I write my prompts, I write my questions, and the system answer uh, simulating uh, my behavior, simulating uh, also the, the, the behavior of any other human agent. But the thing is that the system is not do what the system does. It's not like what my brain is doing at that moment. It's completely different. It's a series of mathematical correlations in a specific way. Of course, now I'm summarizing. The output is very similar to the human language, but what is behind the screen, the screen, what is behind the output? It's something completely different. We are projecting the simulation. We are projecting, and this is an imaginary act. We are projecting the simulation. We are projecting the, the, the fantasy of a machine, which is able to be like humans. Yes, but in reality, it. sorry. No, sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead, please. But in reality, that machine is not like humans. Yes. So you, you're doing it. You're doing it again. This is so interesting. So you, you're throwing it back to the human. So it's not AI. You're not emphasizing that AI is doing the simulation. It is us who are simulating some part of our unconscious, I suppose, or maybe that's not precise enough, onto the machine and back. So, well, you can kind of correct this, but let me now, I think it's a good moment now. We, we, we've been going a bit slowly and it's necessary because we have two kind of big jewels to unpack for Lacan and Latour, so difficult, but let me read the kind of the definitions of, or your interpretation, your claim about what AI is, as, as I, I read it in, in, your, in your work. So you say AI is a new stage in the process of human identification. And I suppose but at this moment we've arrived, we, we just started talking about identification. Yeah. And you also write that AI is a new development of the unconscious. And that's what you call the algorithmic unconscious, which was the title of that article I mentioned at the beginning. So perhaps this is a good moment to start telling us about identification, chain of identification, Lacan's mirror stage, because it's through Lacan and then through your reinterpretation of Lacan through Latour that we can unpack this claim of yours, I suppose. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a big question. Um, well, yes, in that, uh, in that article, what I was trying to do was to unify two intuitions, Lacan's intuition and Latour's intuition. On the one hand, we have Lacan, big French psychoanalyst who developed a theory of identification based on what we call the stage of mirror. Basically for Lacan, identification is, I would say so summarizing, of course, is the first, the essential psychic act. This means that, and this is very interesting because this is a, a characteristic of psychoanalysis. Identification is always alienation. This means that the human subject identifies itself through the relation with an object, through the relation with something else. Think about the Oedipal complex. The identification with the mother and then prohibition, prohibition of incest, identification with the father. It's more complex, of course, but for Freud also, identification is always true. It 
can be possible. It's realized always through the mediation, the interrelation with, uh, with another object. Now, Lacan, Lacan refers to this, uh, to this concept, to this idea of alienation. Identification is always alienation. And first of all, he emphasizes the role of Im the image, what he called imago. So first of all, the, the baby identifies itself to the image of his mother, to the image of his parents. They are like kind of mirror. The babies in that article, in a famous article, Lacan calls, uh, talks about the mirror, the mirror experience. The baby identifies itself looking at the mirror, looking at itself reflected in the mirror. And he identifies itself because he sees itself as a unity. His body, its body as a unity. But apart from that, the, the subject passed through a series of identification, through images, through imagination. And then this chain of identifications is uh, stopped, is interrupted by what Lacan calls a symbolic, the symbolic chain, the name of the father, which is basically the, the experience of the Oedipal complex, the eruption of the law, the eruption of the prohibition. So the law stops long chain of imaginary identification. So as you can see in Lacan, subject's identification goes from the imaginary, the imagination, to, from the imagination to the symbolic. The symbolic identification, the identification with the symbolic is the real identification in the sense that it can stop the psychotic loops of imaginary identifications. Now, as you can see, in Lacan, the pivotal of identification, the condition of identification, is the symbolic, that is, the language. For Lacan, symbolic is language. So a kind of... Uh, third domain, which is not the baby, which is not the human subject, but it's not the, the, the parents either. Um, it's a kind of external condition that represents the, also the, the, the social uh, realm. So the symbolic determine the, the, the good identification of the subject. Now, what is the intuition of Latour? According to Latour, artifacts and technologies are the essence of human, of human subject, in the sense that we cannot talk about humans without talking about technologies. So also, techn we have to understand that technologies are an active, essential part of human mind, also of human psyche. So I try to unify these two intuitions. This means that we can talk about technologies, we can consider technologies, we can consider artifacts as the symbolic. This means that we can attribute also a form of identification to the artifacts. As I said before, the artificial intelligence is not just a mirror, it's also an agent. We, it's also an agent that wants to be like humans. This is its purpose. So it represents another form of symbolic a kind of evolution of human language. 
same combinatorial structure because it's based on data and algorithms. Same form of uh, same function because in Lacan, the symbolic it's just a uh, combinatorics is just based on a metaphor and a metonyms that is uh, forms of uh, uh, substitutions and uh, transformation of what Lacan call signifiers the material elements of our language so artificial intelligence it's a new form of symbolic this is what I mean and therefore, it's a new form of identification. This identification cannot be thought only as a human identification, but also must be thought. It must be thought also as a, the identification through the machine. I mean that uh, in the, the human identification process, the machine also try to develop a kind of uh, identification process. As I said before, the machines wants to be like humans. And this is the Latour's intuition. We can attribute, we can consider uh, technological artifacts as active as social agents, so psychical agents uh, like humans. What I mean is that uh, in this new era, in this new epoch, in this new time of human of humanity, human identification passed through machine identification. So on the one hand, we we have the we have humans who identify through symbolic, the symbolic, through the language, basically. On the other hand, we have machines such as artificial intelligence, who are a new form of symbolic. And they have an impact on human symbolic. So they develop new forms of identification. This means also that uh, the new, this new form of symbolic, which is AI, also has an, an imaginary effect the simulation we were talking uh, we were talking about uh, earlier simulation means it has an effect this symbolic has an effect on human imagination on human symbolic too okay Let, let's continue there because i think we got to the meat of the of the proposal here and and this is yeah. hard at least this is hard for me but so Lacan was, if I could put it in, in rough words, was missing. What so what Latour brings to Lacan is to continue to continue this chain of identification. Now by taking technology as yeah yeah okay correct me yeah, go ahead. it's very it's very um, I, I I can put it in a, in a more uh, I would say in easier terms. As I said. For Lacan, language is essential for human identification. Latour forces us to think more about uh, technology and the relation between language and technology and how technology can shape human language. This means that AI is able to shape our symbolic, our language, in a new way. This means also that this creates the conditions of a new forms of human identification. This is, a, I don't know if it's clear. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. The interesting thing is that this new form of symbolic is not just, a, it's not just a, a passive uh, uh, artifact like human language, it's also an agent. This means that we, we don't simply use this language. We have to interact with its goals, its dynamics, its intentionalities. As I said, 
it's an active agent with a specific purpose, being like humans. So we don't have just one mirror, but multiple mirrors. Now, how is AI as a technology different than, say, a computer game I would play in the 90s or a, or a, or a, or a type machine or, or a musical instrument? Because um, I, I think you're saying that there's a difference in kind here in, in, in this technology as, as part of the chain of identification. And that's perhaps the algorithmic unconscious. So why, why AI is different than this in what Latour would say about Lacan? Well, uh, first, why why AI is so different? Because um, in AI, in AI, there is first of all the purpose. I mean, when I play with a video game, the purpose, the goal of the video game is not being like me. Is uh, the fact that I can play the, the the game. In AI, the purpose is being like me. A machine is trying to be like me this is its function this is its goal but this is also connected to many different uh, fantasies in human mind because what is very interesting in uh, interesting in ai is that it's not just a technology it's also culture so it's connected to many different uh, uh, fears Human fears, uh, the, the, the fear that uh, the humans will be replaced by machines, uh, but also the, the Frankenstein uh, fear, uh, according to which the, 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 the machines will rebel against, against humans. Uh, so there is also the so-called uncanny valley. More the machine, the more the machine will be like humans the more humans uh, feel this kind of weirdness this kind of uncanniness so as you can see ai is a specific kind of technology from this point of view yes so then let's talk about this new development right the new development of the unconscious so i think i understand now the steps so what it is what is it doing to our unconscious so i can see now why it's a new step in this chain of identification and why it's special what is it doing to our unconscious well this is a big question in, in the sense that uh... Frankly, I don't know. In the sense that this is the object of our, uh, of my research, so I am. Uh, we have to explore the 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 the, the impact of this kind of uh, AI systems on our mind, and uh, which kind of uh, dyna psychological dynamics they can create. So, it we still have to. To better understand this, it is uh, this relation and uh, the evolution of human mind in contact with AI. I would say that uh, one of the what we could you you can you can see, but this is a very easy uh, example is the manipulation manipulation through internet, uh, what we call uh, digital manipulation. So the use of AI to manipulate people's behavior, for example, through fake news or uh, uh, through uh, advertisements, etc. I would say that something that is very important, and we have to work on this, um, is the influence of subliminal stimuli, the use of subliminal stimuli uh, to manipulate people through AI. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can see some applications and implications of this. But let me linger here because at the beginning we said, well, what your approach is not, or it's not emphasizing. And that was very helpful, at least to me, to frame the conversation. Another thing that your approach is not emphasizing, which it, it, in some way um, is needed, given, given, given that so often the moment we say AI, they seem to be two camps, right? Those that are 
enamored, like like heaven is close, the transhumanist at last. And then the other attitude, which is, oh no, you know, the hell is 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 at the around the corner, that's the end of humanity. So far in this conversation and in, in the words I've read from you, you, you refrain from following to either of those. But perhaps now is a moment to say a bit more about it, because if it's changing, if it's affecting the de development of our minds in that sense, um, what about the ethical or meta-ethical implications of that? Without, I, again, without following this binary classification of either you think it's good, like thumbs up or thumbs down, but it's obviously it's obviously going to do good things to us and bad things to us. And my sense is that it's going to do more bad things than good things. Well, um, again, it is a this is a very big question in the sense that um, I started to I started exploring uh, the relation between uh, human unconscious and uh, AI because I was uh, interested also in the problem of control, how to control technology, why should we control uh, technology? And because I was not satisfied with the way in which uh, um, scholars uh, uh, define and shape and interpret uh, the concept of control, you know that there is a huge literature about controlling AI, how should we control AI, and uh, the effect of AI. I was not satisfied with uh, uh, how scholars framed the problem of control, also because they, they didn't take into account uh, the problem of uh, how to communicate with these machines. How can we effectively communicate with these machines. This is not the, 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 the idea that I will start talking with my laptop uh, trying to to be to, to be friend of him. Um, this is much more the idea how to how to put our desires, our needs, our uh, intentions into these machines. So into the design of these machines. And then I realized that what is much more important is how can we know, do we know our desires, our intentions, our needs connected to these machines? Mm -hmm. This is much more important. What do we want from these machines? And how can we communicate? How can we know this? And how can we communicate this to these machines effectively? <clears throat> uh, I think this is a necessary premise of uh, the ethics of technology. We can be, we can uh, develop. Uh, an ethical perspective on AI, only if we know our desires, our needs, and then our values related to these machines. So, uh, to answer your question, uh, uh, I would say that uh, maybe we need more empirical research about uh, about uh, the relation between human unconscious and machines. Yeah, yeah. My my papers, my writings are very theoretical. I take into account also practical experience and uh, uh, concrete examples, but we need much more research on the relation between machine behavior and uh, uh, human unconscious, human mind in general. Um, so, Yes, these technologies will shape, will influence, will modify our brain, our interactions with the world. But I think we still we need we still need uh, much more research to better understand how. Now, as you were saying this, I was imagining a sequel to the movie Hair. 
<clears throat> yeah. Where, where the guy sits down with a psychoanalyst and, well, I don't know if the psychoanalyst should be asking questions like that, but basically the question is basically what you're saying. So do you know your desires onto that algorithmic yeah. unconscious, right? So what, of course, it depends on the people and so on, but as, 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 as humanity and as we're toying with this, what do you think our desires are with respect to AI? What are those? What are we yeah. doing with it? As you said before, uh, we can, a very, a very easy example is that of transhumanism. So our desire uh, is the first desire we have. It's kind of uh, the desire of being, uh, yeah. being yeah. saved by these machines, yeah. basically. Yeah. In immortality, right? And not just immortality, but uh, how can we know better by using these machines? Because we are not able to, to know ourselves. Mm -hmm. We need to use these machines to know ourselves, to answer our questions. So uh, to, to acquire more information about myself. Mm -hmm. This is what I said before. We don't have mo just one mirror now. We have many different mirrors mm -hmm. another another interesting phenomenon is the fear about these machines so we are afraid of uh, the fact that uh, uh, the ai will cancel uh, all our jobs so we are afraid of the consequences uh, like a kind of uh, terrible uh, disgrace, a terrible trauma in the history of the humanity. But this is another, uh, I think this is more uh, a consequence on our, <clears throat> on our conditions. Mm. We yes. cannot understand our world. So we are asking a technology to, to give us this understanding. No. I want to ask you about academia and the reception of these ideas in academia and also in, in, in companies. Um, so if you've talked to people at Google or OpenAI and so on, but do they care? Do they even know this problem exists and we are, as we're discussing it here? Um, are they doing something about it precisely about, I love how you put it before, not so much can we control by putting our desires there, but do we even know what those are? And and if we know, then we we may be able to control what this is going to do to us in a much more sensible way. So do they care about this? Well, uh, this is a, uh, it's very hard to say in the sense that uh, in academia so far, uh, not so much in the sense that in, in academia, in, uh, in the academic uh, context uh, there today, the, main approaches to technologies are uh, uh, responsible innovation, technology assessment. So the majority of scholars uh, who work in this field are more attracted by this kind of paradigms, uh, responsible innovation, uh, so ethics of technology, technology assessment, uh, how should we apply ethics to AI systems and, and these kind of things. Then in in the, the companies in the I would say that uh, maybe there is uh, uh, more awareness about the problem. To, just to give you an example, two years ago I was contacted by a startup in Milan. Uh, they were interested in uh, my work because they were developing a new approach to AI based on a mathematical formalization of Hume, of uh, Freud made up psychology. And they they were uh, they, they, they thought that they could uh, develop, they could uh, build a new kind of AI that were able to to solve to better solve certain kind of problems by using less data anyway but they were they were uh, very interested in this kind of ideas 
Mm. Well, I can sense how probably these fascinating ideas you're sharing with us today are obviously a minority report in the way we well, think. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I was pleasantly surprised to, to encounter your work. Okay, at yeah, I mean, can speak about this slightly differently. Also, I have to say that psychoanalysis is not a good uh, standing in the sense that uh, it is seen as a pseudoscience uh, with no empirical uh, foundations uh, and uh, there are many different psychoanalysis, uh, many different theories. Uh, I mean, this is in partly true. Psychoanal psychoanalysis needs better empirical foundation. This is true, absolutely. Sometimes psychoanalysts are not able to justify their, their claims and they have poor epistemology. This is absolutely true. But this doesn't mean that we have to cancel psychoanalysis or that the research on the human unconscious is not yeah. important. Because as I said before, human unconscious is not uh, the property of psychoanalysis anymore. Today also neuroscience mm. study uh, human unconscious. Uh, human unconscious, it's a research field in itself. It's not just about psychoanalysis. Yes, in, in ending, because I want to open it to the audience to make comments and questions. I wanted to touch, and it's a huge topic, but on, on mental illness. And maybe here there's an interesting triad where psychoanalysis through AI could provide even technological, if you want, kind of humane-centered, humanity-centered, technological, it sounds like an oxymoron, but probably it's not, humane-centered yeah. technological solutions to mental illness. What's the role of mental illness in, in, in this chain of identification and mm. so on? I don't know. I think I think that a practical realization of this kind of uh, uh, search can be the design of uh, more interactive interfaces uh, between humans and AI. Then uh, today, developing uh, new tools in uh, uh, mental health, so also developing uh, AI in mental health. It's a big challenge because this could mean uh, making uh, mental health more affordable, more accessible, and also more personalized. So this is a very important uh, challenge. I think that psychoanalysis can uh, collaborate also with other psychological approaches to realize AI tools that can help therapists in uh, handling, uh, in uh, developing their therapies, uh, for example, in the interpretation of symptoms. Uh, I would not say that uh, AI can, uh, can heal, can fix the problems just by itself. That makes sense. Okay, one more, one more, one more, one more comment here to make. This is more a speculative question about the future human. Um, so perhaps a few decades ago, Lacan or Latour, or maybe Latour last year before he died a year ago, but let's say 50, 40, 30 years ago, they could have imagined or a science fiction writer could have imagined, well, there'll be such a thing as AI and if they if if they knew about Lacan and Latour, they could have in a way advanced this kind of new stage of development, right? Um, in the unconscious. Uh, now, can you now imagine what a fourth stage will be, right? Because it's like we talked about mirrors, language, technology, then technology that we build so that it is like us, or this is like the you know the stage is going up. Yeah, yeah. What, after AI, let's forget about AI for a moment. What could be another stage? Is is, is it something one can even imagine how it would look like and yeah in that in that respect i don't know honestly maybe a more a form of uh, maybe the, the the movie her uh, some form of more uh, powerful and personalized ai systems that are able to to live with humans to be like humans to also to have uh, love stories with uh, with humans 
that can be a possible scenario why not hmm. yeah maybe extraterrestrial beings <laughs> if they landed on the planet at some moment right that would create a big <laughs> a big well <laughs> if they are so intelligent i don't think they will stop here uh, <laughs> so long <laughs> all right okay well i think that's um, that's more than enough for me thank you i've learned quite a lot talking you. to you and you've been very kind of patient and and deep and generous unpacking this for me and i hope the audience also enjoyed it let's open it up for comments cl clarifications complaints and questions and so on thank you so thank you luca thank you alex uh at this point we open it up to all of you if you have any questions comments uh, that you would like to ask, um, you can use your the raise your hand function at the bottom of the screen. Otherwise, you can physically raise your hand and I'll, and I'll look for you. Richard, would you like to come in and ask your question? You're muted, Richard. There you go. Thank you very much. Very enlightening. And my question, I was struck when you said that AI wants to be like us. Yeah. Could you come, you know, when we think about desire, wanting things, that's also an embodied feeling. It's not just something that's cognitive. So could you embellish that a little bit more? How yeah. how does a how does a machine desire something absolutely absolutely thank you so much thank you so much for this question yes i was absolutely i was uh, was using a kind of uh, metaphor in that case um i wouldn't say that uh, ai has desires uh, as humans of course uh, but there is a kind of intentionality ai if they have ai has a purpose as a goal, uh, this goal is a simulation to simulate uh, to simulate human behavior, and this is uh, the goal that some designers, the designers of the system, implemented. Uh, they, they, they put into the system. They put this goal into the system. So AI wants to be like humans means that uh, the goal of AI is to be like humans. In this kind, in this sense, there is also a certain kind of intentionality in AI systems. Then, of course, I was using a metaphor, but what uh, what interests me, what strikes me, is the the contact between two forms of intentionality. On the one hand, human intentionality that is also a desire. Um, the desire for identification. On the other hand, there is a form of intentionality, the intentionality of the machine, which is, which has a form of agency, a kind of ability. And these intentionalities being like humans. So it's not just a mirror. It's also a mirror that goes a little bit far. I don't know if it's clear. No, I think I understand what you mean better now. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the question. If I may add here, because it's like a corollary to the question, thank you for making this remark, Richard, because it, it, it was a note I took. Can you then clarify when you speak about AI as an agent? And I suppose mm. this is the Latour way of using the word agent, but in what sense does it have agency as we tend to think that we have it? Well, um, agency, I mean, agency... By agency, I mean uh, the ability to uh, to act and change a particular kind of situation to have an impact, and this is something that all our artifacts have. I mean, when I when I cook, uh, I use uh, my my fork, for example, and by using that fork, I extend my uh, my agency. The fork has an agency in the sense that it allows me to to do certain kind of things. Uh, my TV has an agency in the sense that it transforms my way to I don't know to get more information about the world. So all our artifacts 
have a, a particular kind of agents and also AI systems have an agents and this agency can transform, can, can impact my agency. Could I interject something there? Yes. Um, I'm, uh, one of my heroes is Michael Polanyi, and he talked about how, how we are capable of projecting agency beyond tools. So I'm, I'm a retired surgeon. And after a period of doing surgery, you can feel the end of your scissors, even though you can't see them, like if they're inside a wound. And Polanyi understood that as a projection of consciousness. So my problem with trying to understand how a machine could be more like a human is I don't think that potential for projecting agency is there in a machine. Hmm. Okay, I understand. Yeah, I mean, we can also talk about the projection of our uh, uh, intentionality of our agency onto the machine. But I would say that this doesn't change anything because in any case, the artifacts have still an agency in the sense that they can impact our reality. They have uh, an active role in our, uh, in our uh, context. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gabriel, would you like to come in? Yeah, thank you. First, I want to thank Luca. I'm here today because I read his article in AI and Society about the case of Replica, and I really loved it. It's really brilliant. Uh, so it's been so thank stimulating, you. so stimulating listening to you today. And and I have a question. I'm I'm not sure I, I will be able to formulate it clearly, but the idea is that. You have some somehow suggested that with AI we will witness a kind of autonomy or autonomization of language or the symbolic domain in a way. And then I wonder if this will challenge, will confront us whether we are really basically narratives, the symbolic domain or the imaginary domain, or we, if we are more than that, right? And what more? And I don't know, maybe we can, we can research in two directions, embodiment, as someone already said just with the previous question, or maybe also transcendence. Are we more than the symbolic change? Are, are we the container for this symbolic change to manifest? Right? And in that regard, I would like to point to this idea that you say, like identification as the foundational act of the psyche. And I would like to challenge that because we have more and more ev evidence of newborn babies being able to reciprocate, to enter in reciprocation games, you and me, just after being born. And I wonder then if relationship is more fundamental than identification. And if relationship is more fundamental than identification, then if we are creating this autonomization of AI in the symbolic domain, I wonder if this will put a lot of pressure on relationships, on the relational domain. It would kind of get of an autonomy of relationships and we will get caught in a kind of chain of relational domains dominated by this symbolic autonomy uh, domain we have created. I don't know if I've been able to explain my idea, but no. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Well, uh, I think that the idea of uh, the autonomization of symbolic chain, the symbolic chain, uh, I think it's quite uh, interesting because uh, uh, it opens much more possibilities on a psychoanalytical level in the sense that uh, uh, in our identification, we don't have just uh, 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 a symbolic chain that is like our language, uh, that is not active, but the symbolic chain, the AI symbolic chain is more interactive from a certain point of view. Uh, so about the, 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 the last point you, you raise about the identification and reciprocity, Procation. Um, I would say that you're right. Uh, I would just uh, point out that, uh, from my point of view, I mean, in my opinion, uh, identification in, from a psychoanalytical point of view is already reciprocation in the sense that it's already, uh, it's always a kind of alienation in the sense that it's relation to an object. But what is the 
I think that the, the real essential feature of psychoanalysis is that identification passes through uh, the relation to the others, to the other, but the other has been lost. This is the point. And so there is always at the root of identification, the experience of trauma. We lost our mother, we lost basically our uh, power of control. And this is also very interesting in how we relate to the symbolic chain, because the symbolic chain has to repair to some extent this experience of trauma. This is also interesting in our relation to AI, because uh, we're looking for something uh, we refer to AI to some extent also to, to fix the trauma. Anyway, I, I, I don't want to delve into this, but uh, so I think that uh, identification is already reciprocation from this point of view. Of course, then from a psychoanalytical point of view, this involves uh, lost and uh, trauma and uh, the relation with the lost object. I don't know if it's clear. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Veronica. Um, yes, thank you to all of you. Uh, no, I wonder if my question will make sense after what you just said, Luca. But anyway, it seems like we're doing really pretty well uh, designing these agents from a left brain perspective, if I can use it this way. And we are starting to get into the possibilities of understanding how to bring the element of emotions into it, namely what would lead to a right brain interaction, if you allow me to use this process. And, and it seems it's, it's going to be indispensable, particularly if we want to really learn about ourselves and we go back to the unconscious that we started with. So, and then, you know, if we throw intentionality into the midst of this, and we keep the intentions with only a left brain mechanism on the part of the agents, then this is when, do you think we, we, we're going to take a wrong term? Namely, how are we going or are we are we starting to think about the role of emotions? And it feels like, yes, again, it's this mirror image. We feel like the agent has an emotion because it has all these features that we already designed. But what what would be the real thing? When will we know if there is an actual emotions there, namely a right brain, left brain interaction? And my other quick question was, what work from Latour um, is the one that speaks most about technology? Which of his books? Um, sorry, what is the second question? Uh, which which book from Latour ah, okay. is, is about technology? Sorry, I missed the, 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 the first one. Sure. Okay, so first of all, if I understood correctly the role of emotions, you were talking about emotions. Well, uh, this, is, uh, this is another part of the problem because uh, uh, emotions, uh, uh, at least from a psychoanalytical point of view, they are uh, connected much more to the imaginary imagination and fantasies. Uh, I would say to give just a quick uh, a quick answer to your question, if I understood correctly, it's also important from my point of view to uh, consider, uh, um, of course, the emotions that are at the basis of the identification. So also the desire of identification, but also the 
the relation with the um, with the mother, which is the fundamental experience of human identifications. That means that uh, there are several forms of emotions, several types of emotions. So the need to be recognized, the need to be uh, welcomed, the need to be feeded, the need to, to receive a certain kind of protection. This is interesting because we look for this kind of things in any kind of in the identification we we make in our life now for example what i what i claimed in that in that paper is that we are looking for the same needs the same things in our relation with with artificial intelligence because if the first form of identification with the mother is characterized by those kind of uh, emotions. So we have the tendency to repeat that kind of emotional pat pat pattern. And it's interesting, for example, the transhumanism, the example of transhumanism, we are looking for safety, we are looking for recognition also, we are looking for uh, uh, integrity also, because we are talking also about our body. Through technology, through artificial intelligence, so we are asking the machine for the same thing we ask our our uh, ancestral our mother our our parents i don't know if it's clear yes very clear thank you and the, about the book well you can uh, you there are many many different books of latour about technology i would suggest for example uh, science in action which okay. is uh, but also uh, there are there are many different books. If you, if you if you want, I can send you I can send you also some of them. It's not a problem. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Veronica, for coming in. Um, we're now going to take a question from Michael, but I'm going to turn my computer around and let him use mine as he's sitting here beside me. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for um, all of this. And I really appreciate your precision, Luca, with uh, your introduction and everything. So one of the things that came up while this was going on with AI, and it brought up the idea of uh, AI being anticipatory, and I believe it may thre thread in with the last question as well, with like you're talking about like the mother and uh, mothers and parents do tend to try to anticipate the needs of others, but a Siri on a Mac actually just actually fired up when it heard something within this discussion, trying to anticipate the needs or a question that it thought that it may have heard. And then uh, I am a writer and I also use uh, like Gmail with, it's it'll try to autocomplete, but then I find yeah. myself having to really actively think, what do I wanna say? Yeah, yeah. Is that yeah. accurate? So you spoke about desires. So then is it also trying to anticipate our desires as well? And are we kind of building well, that? Too? I, yeah, of course, because, oh, okay, uh, all internet now works like this. I mean, uh, the, the internet is based on AI systems that, um, that give you kind of uh, uh, advices for uh, personalized advices for uh, your... Uh, your purchases so and they're based on your data your behavior your uh, way of acting uh, on the net so uh, they already doing uh, they already mm -hmm. doing this kind of things they try to anticipate you they try to anticipate your uh, your behavior basically mm -hmm. and so yeah but then there's like this, is it really what we are anticipating if we had a pause to really think about it? Or is it kind of like, could we get in this thing of close enough and kind of um, the idea of almost the AI becoming more creative mm -hmm. and us really leaning on the AI for the answers more and more so we become less complex and this is a very yeah. cool way to state it 
while the AI becomes more complex. Well, yes. You mean if if, uh, if this is possible? You mean? Uh, or is this like a general trajectory that we may have to? Yeah, you know? I think I think we can say this. I, I think I think it's a, it's perfectable uh, perfectable uh, reason. Um, of course, we are. Uh, well, I mean, there is this tendency because AI is based on recognizing patterns and replicate also patterns. Yeah. So, of course, humans become much more uh, foreseeable and, uh, and how to say, um, foreseeable and predictable than before. Yes. Yeah. I guess my question boils down to will could uh, is the is there a pitfall with us becoming even less conscious of what our desires truly are as humans yeah yeah i think this is possible but uh, the other option is that uh, ai uh, decides for us ai shapes our desires so not just anticipation it's more decision in the sense that it's able through uh, not just advices, but through manipulation, what I called before subliminal manipulation, uh, to influence our behavior in a more, in a deeper way through our uh, unconscious perception and cognition. This is perfectable. Uh, this, is, uh, this is reasonable. This is something that can happen. I mean, for example, the EU AI Act, one of the last important EU regulation about AI, in the Title II, Article 5, they explicitly mentioned the risk to deploy AI system to uh, to use, to, to influence uh, right. human behavior using subliminal stimuli. Yeah. And I have a fair amount of uh, friends who teach yeah. at Universita and... One of their concerns is that the AIs tend to be writing the papers, but then you also have the AIs that check the papers for plagiarism as well. Yeah, yeah. So it's this, you know, is a human actually involved or is it just, are we just kind yeah. of inputs in getting something out that then gets checked by another AI? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have any answers. There's a lot of questions. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Luca. Um, Raymond, would you like to come in? Yes. Everyone hear me? Perfectly. I think I think um, I came into the talk late, so please excuse please excuse my not hearing the first part of the talk. I think Richard said something that for me, in thinking about AI, was was quite profound. That you can move from human sentience out towards the tool. But something that I have felt is that you can't move from the tool towards human sentience. Um, so my question is, is it possible to program AI to be in the words of Ian McGilchrist, an emissary and not an actual master? And then the more troubling question for me is how is it that and I, I, I don't want to denigrate computer programmers in any way, but how is it that computer programmers are in some sense seeking to become, quote, the masters of the universe when, when perhaps they themselves should see themselves as emissaries as well? Um, yes, so, so if I understood correctly, thank you for the question. Uh, the first question is about uh, if is it possible to program AI um, without uh, this uh, search for uh, power on uh, on our world, basically, uh, to uh, to avoid the risk that they that they will become master of our world. And maybe master, maybe master, just to qualify it, is um, maybe a little bit too strong of a word, but center might be might be a better better word. Just in okay, 
Well, yes, uh, absolutely. I think it's possible, but it, it depends on the condition of this uh, programming in the sense that, uh, uh, for example, in the in the book, uh, The Algorithmic Unconscious, uh, I introduced uh, the idea of emotional programming in the sense that I, my claim was that when we program, there is not just the, the technical activity, there is also, a, I mean, the emotions can have also an impact on the programming activity. So we have also to be able to analyze the emotions we are transmitting to the to the artifact. So uh, this is co 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 connected to what I, what I said before. We have to under, better understand our desires, our needs, our goals, and to be able to communicate them to the machine. The problem is um, a problem of communication, how to translate all this in programming language and how to program the machine in that way. I, I don't know if it's clear. Thank you. Alex, do you have any closing remarks? Well, yes, and I have also kind of homework for us to think about because so two ideas here briefly, I just mentioned them. If, if Luca wants to reply, but if there's no time to unpack them, that's fine too. <laughs> One is we haven't mentioned Jung, and as you know, in the Paris Center, we we deeply care about Jung's work. So that leaves to be discussed the role that Jung could play in this. And maybe this could be tied to my second kind of homework here is that the last question is pointing to emotions, point, pointing to the right brain, point, pointing to the master and his emissary, intuition, and so on. Well, perhaps we are talking there about the non-algorithmic unconscious and what that can do. And so playing a little bit with the title of your book and your paper as well, um, what about the non-algorithmic unconscious? And I don't think AI can do that. And perhaps that's the part of our humanity that we would also want to be expressed uh, and not all, all the time talk about these algorithmic tricks. And, and we've seen how important they are to our humanity, but also not forget that there, there, there might be something like a non-algorithmic unconscious and, and perhaps that ties with Jung and, and with these really human capacities that I think no machine will ever have. Yeah. Okay, but that's, you know, too, too late. So, so my final comment would be um, more directed, not towards the theme, but towards Luca, saying that we need more thinkers like Luca around. We need them to be supported because we need our companies, our governments and academia to really deeply think about these issues. And I think you, have a, you had more than a glimpse as to how this can be done with subtlety and depth and care. And I don't see this around. So I hope, Luca, that your your thinking and people that think like you can survive in these waters and that we can listen to them because Thank there's you. a lot a lot at stake. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation also. Yeah, our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you both Luca and Alex. And we look forward to seeing you at um, the next event of Future Human when we will have Melissa Nelson with us in November. I don't know, Alex, if you want to take a moment just to let everybody know about um, our new three-part series that will be starting on Friday on Galileo at 400. Yes, uh, I only need about 35 minutes to do so. So let's go. Now, briefly, this month of October actually in two days, the 20th of October of 1623, Galileo wrote a note to the Pope as a preface to a book he wrote and published that year called The Assayer, Il Saggiatore in, Il Saggiatore in Italian. And it's a very interesting book. It's a little bit of a soap opera because he's complaining about somebody strong his own thoughts. So it looks like like some TV program you could see, or, or or even like Twitter, when academics would be fighting about, no, you misrepresented my view. But in those 270 pages, there's some jewels, some cornerstones of 
science as we know it, because in that book, it's where Galileo speaks about mathematics as the language in which the book of nature is written, whether you agree or not, that has influenced for 100 years. He also makes this comment about the, the kind of the primary qualities and then the sensations and how the latter ones are secondary, because if we're not there, they're not there. And that has influenced 400 years of living consciousness aside as a scientific pro um, problem to tackle by science. And there's a third ingredient and more to unpack there also about the history, which is the method, the so-called scientific method about observation and not appeal to authority. So in this book, there's so much to celebrate 400 years later. And so we decided to organize a series called Galileo at 400, 400 years later. And it's going to have three parts. In the first one, I will unpack together with James the, the Italian book and all these aspects so that we we get to know Galileo more, his ideas and his temperament. And I encourage you all, and it's on the website of the Paris Center in, in this event, to click and, and download the English, the abridged English translation by Drake. It's available on PDF. If you can, read the man, read Galileo. So we'll discuss this in part one. In part two, we've invited Dean Radin and Abby Loeb. And there, what to, what, I mean, two really, really outstanding academics. And with them, we'll have this dance about inner and outer telescopes because Avi Loeb is, is um, leading the Galileo project, looking for signs of technology, extraterrestrial technology out there. And Dean Radin has been leading for many years the more psychic um, research on our very human capacities. So it would be very interesting to see what they can say in the context of Galileo today with inner and outer telescopes. And then on the third installment, we will round it up with the Galileo Commission folks. And we'll talk about, well, looking through the telescope today. And so I think this will make a very nice celebration of Galileo at 400. You're all invited. It's, it's free and you can find the information on our website. I've just put the link in the chat so you can sign up there for free um, and you will be sent the link right away to, to join us on Friday for the first installment. Anyways, thank you, Luca. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Thank, thank you, Alex. You. Thank, you. thank you, everybody, for being with us here today. And we look forward to seeing you here at the Paris Center in the future. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Goodbye.